Hello everyone, my name is Sophia and today I'm going to be talking to you about how I traveled through the southeastern United States by myself with no experience on a bicycle, specifically this bicycle. Her name is Tallulah, or Tilly for short. Let's get started. Okay, so it all started back in summer 2019. I was freshly graduated from the University of Waterloo with no career plans but a fierce passion for environmental and animal rights advocacy. So one day, a group of activists and I were meeting with our local MP to discuss animal agriculture subsidies. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the current government is putting millions of dollars into the meat, dairy, and egg industries in the form of loans and grants. Um, I don't think I need to explain to you how detrimental this type of spending is, not just to the animals, but also um, to the planet when we know that animal agriculture is a leading contributor to climate change. So our goal in meeting with the MP was to discuss these concerns and ask um, that we put an end to animal agriculture subsidies. You know, and we thought, I guess somewhat naively, that the government would listen to the concerns of its citizens. Well, unfortunately, it turns out we were wrong. And after a very frustrating meeting, I left with this overwhelming sense of doom about the future of the planet because our leaders, who are the ones with the most power to make change, refuse to take the types of drastic action that we require. So after years of doing advocacy work and building frustration and despair, um, this meeting brought it all to a head and my burnout got the best of me. Um, I realized I needed to take a step back and take a bit of a break. So my next question became, what do I do next? Um, what do I do to get away from it all and take this much needed break? Uh, I knew I wanted to experience a different way of life, um, but I also wanted my actions to reflect my concerns for the planet, particularly in regards to the burning of fossil fuels. So because of this, I knew that flying and driving were going to be off my list of options. So what is the most environmentally friendly and ethical way, or environmentally friendly and efficient and ethical way to travel? Um, well, the solution is biking. Um, and it was in that moment that the idea of Soph's bike life was born, which is basically my vision for um, a grand adventure on two wheels that would allow me to get away from um, the, the burnout I was experiencing while still living in line with my environmental ethics. So here's me fully packed up with my bike um, the day that I left Waterloo. Okay, so bike travel, or bike touring as it's referred to, is the perfect solution for travel in the midst of a climate emergency. Um, first and most obviously, it is completely emissions free. There's no gas, it's just pure human powered pedaling um, that's great for the planet, but also great for your health and also great for a budget because other than purchasing the bike, um, traveling on a bicycle is completely free. Um, and to me, just that in itself makes biking a really rad way to get around. Um, secondly, however, biking is also great for the planet because it forces you to be mindful of your consumption. So with landfills um, and natural ecosystems overflowing with things like textile waste and food waste, um, reevaluating our relationship to consumption of physical goods is really important. And as such, a lot of people have been adopting plant-based, zero waste, and or minimalist lifestyles. Um, biking is a great way to bring this type of mindfulness to your consumption because when you have to transport all of your stuff on a bicycle over thousands and thousands of miles, you learn very quickly what is essential and not essential for daily living. Um, one of the essentials that you do have to bring with you, probably the one true essential that you need to bike tour, is food. Um, and so seeing as we're out of VegFest, I figured I would take, talk a little bit more about what I eat um, while I travel on a bike, both as a vegan and as zero waste as possible. Okay, so as you all are aware, um, food is our body's fuel, and so when you're traveling on a bike, eating becomes basically the most important activity you're going to partake in other than the actual pedaling. Um, I try to focus on foods that are calorically dense while also being lightweight and easy to pack, um, and also foods that are like sturdy or don't bruise easily. Um, so this is kind of what I would normally eat in a day. So to start off in the morning, I usually try and drink water. Um, I carry several bottles, like liter bottles on my bike, plus a three liter water bladder. Um, so I try and drink water right when I wake up and eat an apple. 
um, that gets me some fiber and some hydration just to start off the day. Kitty, you're in my way. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Um, and then in terms of actual food, I will use my camping stove and little propane tank to boil some water, which I will use to make tea um, and oatmeal. So I don't actually have any oatmeal on me right now, but I've just got bags of tea in here. Um, when I have the opportunity, I do try to buy tea in bulk, um, and I travel with like a little tea ball, um, but bags are what I have right now. Um, and then with my oatmeal, I mix in peanut butter and jam um, to get me some protein and fats and sugars and just extra calories. And then sometimes if I know I'll be doing a really intense ride, I will also mix trail mix into the oats. Um, then I usually have a B12 supplement, which when I'm traveling, I normally carry in like a little baggie, not this big bulky container. Um, Oh, and then I usually cook my oats and my tea with my iron fish, which just makes sure that my um, food is enriched with some iron. For those of you who don't know, this thing, you can cook it with pasta, with rice, even if you're just boiling water for tea, and it will um, make whatever you're eating higher in iron. So that's kind of cool. Um, then once I'm done eating breakfast, my... Next priority is usually getting water because at this point I'll probably have depleted all of my um, water in my bottles and my bladder. So I'll make my way to like either the nearest gas station or church and find a spigot to fill up. Um, if I can't find any spigots to water, I, for water, I do travel with like water purification tablets um, so I can fill up from like streams or lakes if needed. Um, Okay, so then I try and ride, um, once I filled up on water, I try and ride more than half of the miles I want to do before stopping for lunch. Um, lunch is a pretty standard peanut butter and jam sandwich. Um, I don't usually travel with, like, generic bread. I prefer, like, a naan or a pita bread so it doesn't get squished. <laughs> um... And then with lunch, I'll usually have an apple, some trail mix, and then lots of water. And then if it's really hot, I will put these tablets in my water. They have electrolytes and vitamins, and I find them uh, really refreshing if I've been riding in the hot sun all day. Um, and then in terms of peanut butter and jam, um, normally I mix the two together. When I traveled, I actually had like a special tub for peanut butter that I would fill up in bulk um, and then mix jam that I bought in with it to help conserve space um, and that worked really well because glass containers are really heavy and carrying two of these takes up a huge amount of space in your bags. Um, yeah and then I'll keep riding through the day um, in terms of snacks while I'm riding. Like I said I want to focus on things that don't bruise easily so um, carrots are a good vegetable that I like to snack on, or cucumbers or zucchini, um, granola bars, my preference are cliff bars, but this is what I had right now, and then again, trail mix. Um, I These terry cloth bags um, are really, really, really useful, I found, because they are obviously reusable. You can take them into stores and fill up in their bulk section on like trail mix or oatmeal. Um, and then they also don't take up a lot of space when they're empty. So unlike a container like this, which when it's half empty, you have all this empty space, um, this packs down based on how much food you have left. So that's great. Um, and then, hello. <laughs> Um, we'd move on to dinner, so if I was camping out, um, there's a few options for dinner, and this is probably the area where I use the most plastic packaging, um, particularly single-use plastic packaging. Um, I, If I wanted like a quick dinner um, that doesn't take up a lot of fuel, I would go with ramen or like one of these little rice packages. Um, if I wanted to be a little bit more fancy, then I usually travel with um, spaghetti and red lentils, and I boil those and then add, um, this is a mix of salt, pepper, and garlic powder, nutritional yeast, um, which I also bought in bulk, and this is just an upcycled bag, and then I would slice a tomato onto it um, and mix that in, or ketchup. Um, these are kind of for emergency emergencies only. I steal them from McDonald's and fast food places, um, but they are great when you're in a pinch. So that's my general day-to-day. -day. Um, it's definitely lots of peanut butter and jam sandwiches, lots of trail mix um, because they're super calorically dense, high in protein, high in fat. Um, 
As you probably can tell, I just don't eat a lot of greens when I'm traveling, so when I stop in towns and go to restaurants, I do try and order salads. Um, I do try and pick up, like, vegetables when I can, um, but I definitely miss, like, my morning smoothies when I ride, um, and, like, bananas, so, you know, you make some sacrifices for the good of the journey. Um, and then I also just wanted to note some other things that I bring with me in terms of food. I have a couple of these wax wraps. They're great if I have, um, like half of a tomato or something, or something I wanted to wrap up and eat later. Like sometimes I do buy veggie dogs and I'll need a couple out of the package. I'll wrap the rest in these just to keep them, um, somewhat fresh. And then, um, a little cutting board. This comes in super, super handy um, for chopping veggies and a little cloth. This one's a little dirty um, just to wipe up my camping stove when I'm done eating. And then lastly, a set of reusable cutlery. This is by the brand to go wear, but I actually bought it at a thrift store several years ago. It's got my spoon, my knife, my fork, and a pair of chopsticks. Um, yeah, that's how I eat. I have seen people um, dehydrate their meals ahead of time when they're biking. I think this would be really, really great for minimizing waste, particularly if you're doing a, a shorter tour because you can prep all your food ahead of time and make sure there's no waste going into that. And then you just throw it in a pot with some water, rehydrate it, and you get a really nice, kind of more fancy meal, um, step up from your average like oats and peanut butter. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that basically covers all the food that I eat when I'm on the road, but I do strongly believe that one of the joys of traveling is um, getting to eat at restaurants all in different in all kinds of different places. So um, when I traveled, every t major town that I stopped in, I tried to find vegan restaurants where I could eat and give myself a little bit of a break from all the oatmeal and peanut butter sandwiches. Um, so here are some examples of some of the delicious vegan food I ate on my travels. Um, this was from a little cafe in Ithaca, New York State. This delicious quesadilla and glorious salad. Um, this is at Tip Top Cafe in uh, West Virginia. I was staying literally in the middle of nowhere and went into this local town um, just trying to find somewhere to use the Wi-Fi and found this cafe and almost their entire menu was vegan. I was so surprised. Um, so I got a hot chocolate and some treats. Um, this is a big plate of vegan pancakes. Um, I don't even remember the name of the cafe that I got these from. I was really hungover on, um, from drinking too much moonshine, but I went in and they happened to have vegan pancakes on the menu and they were so delicious. And then this is also in Memphis, Tennessee, um, a restaurant called Imagine Vegan. It's got all these, um, southern foods, deep fried, um, super unhealthy, um, but all vegan, and so I got to try a bunch of new things, and I went a couple times, and there's a picture of the cheese, the delicious cheesecake that I ate. Um, so, you know, although traveling on a bike is slower than traveling in a car or traveling in, on a plane, um, if you're a foodie, it's great because slowing down means you have so many more opportunities to stop and eat at different vegan restaurants, which is always a bonus. Um, so now I knew going into my trip that the zero emissions and kind of more minimalist consumption um, were two major benefits of bike travel, um, but it turns out there is an experiencing it, and that is the reconnection that bike travel brings to the world we live in. Um, when you're riding, you are completely exposed to the raw energy of Mother Nature. You experience all the sights, all the smells and the sounds, and all the sensations um, of the world around you completely unfiltered. Um, this is a simultaneously beautiful and terrifying experience because you're so exposed and you're reminded of how powerless you are to the natural world. Um, I've had days of riding in the blazing hot sun, and then I've had days riding in freezing cold rain where I've had to maneuver through back roads that look like this. Um, I have been woken up in the middle of the night by coyotes howling outside of my tent. Um, 
And I've had days of pedaling against unwavering headwinds. So this picture, as an example, um, was the morning I set out to ride 70 miles in the middle of a polar vortex. And it was freezing, freezing, freezing cold. And I was fighting against this ice cold wind all day. Um, the picture turned out beautiful, but definitely was um, a struggle. And that's the thing with bike touring is even though it's really sometimes grueling work and can be miserable at times, um, I found that for every mile that I pedaled and every flat tire that I encountered, um, it humbled me and it showed me how much that I really take for granted when I travel in a car or if you're traveling in a plane. Um, I can't explain how much better food tastes, even if it's just veggie dogs over a fire. It tastes better after you've been cycling for five or six hours. Um, a shower and a bed to sleep in feel like heaven when you've been sleeping in a tent for a week. Um, and hills, oh my gosh, I will, after this bike trip, I will never look at a hill the same way again. Um, we as a human species have put ourselves above the rest of nature, creating these barriers between us and the rest of life on this planet. And that's really one of the reasons that speciesism exists, is we've put ourselves above other animals. In doing this, we've forgotten the wonders of our true place in this world, which is within the ecosystem. Not just the beauty of the ecosystem, but also the harsh realities of the world that we live in. And I found that by biking, I was able to reconnect with that place. And it brought me a much deeper um, appreciation of the world that we live in, which was amazing. Um, unfortunately, however, the unfiltered experience of bike travel also showed me the destruction of nature on a whole new level. Every day when I was riding, I was passing dead animals on the shoulder of the road. I was seeing garbage littered in the ditches. I had to smell the feces from animal farms and the pesticides sprayed on crops um, where air was being polluted, where there used to be trees and forests that cleaned the air that we breathe. Um, I would hear cars rushing towards me from sometimes miles away. Um, the sounds of their engines disrupting the silence of the road and of the forest that I was riding through. And I had to breathe in the fumes expelled by um, factories and refineries like these ones um, along the bayou on the way to New Orleans. So although my bike trip was supposed to be a break from the doom and gloom of environmental breakdown, I was kind of hit with it full force. Um, but honestly, seeing the destruction of the planet on this level, contrasted with its beauty, seeing it in such an intense way actually drove me to want to protect the land even more. Um, I was seeing the beauty and then seeing the destruction on a much more personal and intimate level. And I would have never seen this if I had been traveling by car or by plane. Now, I want to take this moment to remind you all that I was not a cyclist prior to going on this trip. I commuted around town on my old road bike. Here she is. Her name is Rosanna. Um, and that was about the extent of my cycling experience. I don't think I had ever ridden more than 15 miles in a day. And I didn't really even have that much camping or traveling experience to fall back on. But looking back, the truth is that I really didn't need those things. I learned more about bike travel by actually going out and doing it than I would have if I had stayed at home and researched it. Of course, it is good to be prepared, um, but my bike tour showed me that no matter how much you try, you are never going to be prepared for what the world and for what the road brings you. So why bog yourself down? Why, why make that a barrier to going out and doing it? Um, so as cliche as it sounds, you got to just do it. Um, I want to invite you all to think about your biggest, biggest, wildest dream or aspiration. Um, and think about all the things that are stopping you from reaching that dream. Um, be critical and ask yourself how many of those barriers are actually just you standing in your own way. So as an example, um, before my trip, I followed a fellow on Instagram whose ha hashed, or handle is Plantriotic, and he traveled from Alaska to Costa Rica on his bike. And this was probably my first exposure to the concept of bike travel. Um, I often admired his pictures and the stories from the road, 
and thought about, you know, this is such a great way to get around. This looks like a great adventure. But there was always something supposedly stopping me from pursuing it myself. It really came, came down to the excuse of, I could never do that. You know, that looks beautiful, that looks amazing, but I could never do that. I don't know enough about bikes, or I don't have the money to, to make this work, or, you know, I, I could never live without all of my stuff. Um, so... There was always something stopping me, but when I actually decided, hey, I'm going to go on a bike trip, I sat down and I analyzed those barriers that I had put up for myself, and I realized that I could overcome all of them. None of them were actually um, outside of my control. Um, it was really just me standing in my own way. So, you know, some of the excuses like not knowing about cycling, I decided I was going to learn. So I went to my local bike co-op um, on a more frequent basis and started learning more about um, bike mechanics and how to fix bikes and what I would need for a touring bike. Um, shout out to Recycle Cycles in downtown Kitchener for helping me out. Um, I created a budget for myself to actually make the trip feasible and I started selling my stuff. You know, I let go of my attachment to physical goods and and started shaping my life towards this new goal, which was to get on the bike. And all of a sudden, my bike trip was becoming a reality. I purchased a bike, I was buying the equipment, I was doing some short rides just to test things out. And it was really kind of magical to see that all these barriers I'd put up for myself were really just me. Um, so here's me with my bike after our first ride ever. Um, we rode to Guelph and back just to get a sense of like what it would feel like to ride the bike fully loaded. Um, we got caught in the middle of a thunderstorm. We had to battle headwinds, but I still had a great time and I was so excited for this trip. Um, now, of course, I don't want to overlook the role of my privilege in terms of assisting me along the way, um, particularly as a white person in a sport that's dominated by white people. I know that my travels were made easier and safer by the color of my skin. So because of this, I have a huge amount of respect for people of color taking similar journeys, um, knowing that they face um, more barriers than I did. And I think it's really important within the cycling community that we do better to um, show uh, diversity in terms of our representation and um, do things to actually make communities more accessible to all, all people with all, in all walks of life. Hopefully by now you're all excited and inspired about the idea of bike travel. And so I wanted to give you all some beginner tips to help you get started if it's something that you're interested in pursuing yourself. Um, so first, in terms of preparation, you're going to need to gather some supplies. Uh, the main thing being you're going to need a bicycle. Now a lot of people think, including myself, um, think that you need one of these specialty touring bikes um, to get started. But that's really not the case. Um, you're you don't have to go out and buy a fancy or expensive bike, particularly if you're just dipping your toes in the water. Um, my recommendation would be check out the bike that you already have, if you have a bike, um, and see if it's in good enough condition to tour with. Uh, the beauty of bikes is that they are super DIY and you can fix them really easy and customize them really easily. Um, so the bike that you have might just need a few alterations to make it appropriate for bike travel. Um, if you don't have a bike or if you want to buy a bike, um, my recommendation would be check out Kijiji, Facebook Marketplace, or um, bike touring Facebook groups. Um, you can often find good bikes for sale there. Um, and then in addition to that, check out your, lo your local bike co-op or community bike shop. Again, somewhere like um, Recycle Cycles in downtown Kitchener, or like this picture was taken in at Delta Bike Projects, which is in Mobile, Alabama. Um, these are places where um, they will help you fix your bike, they can hook you up with some um, parts, spare parts, um, or if you want to like switch out your handlebar or your seat, you can often find replacements at um, bike shops. Um, they're also just really great community spaces, so if you want to learn more about bike mechanics, um, you want to gain some skills, or just get more involved in like some community rides or what's going on in your local cycling community, um, bike co-ops and community bike shops are really, really great for that. Um, also, if you're wanting to teach yourself, YouTube is a really, really good resource. Um, again, the beauty of bikes is that they're super DIY. So um, even once you buy your bike, you can 
change things. Um, if you don't like the handlebars or if you don't like the seat, you can change it out for something else. So don't feel, even once you've bought a bike, don't feel like you're locked into that one. Um, now, once you have a bike, you're basically good to go. Um, you have wheels, you can go wherever you want to. But of course, if you're going to be going longer distances, um, you're probably going to want to pack food and probably a spare pair of clothing, your toothbrush, etc. Um, so you're going to have to think about how you want to pack your bike. Um, you can go um, with bags. So in this picture, you can see this bike is fully loaded up in um, a few different ways. You can use panniers, which are these front bags. They mount onto the sides of your wheels. Or you can go with frame bags, which mount under your seat or into the main frame of your bike. Um, keep in mind, bags do tend to be a little bit more expensive, especially because they are a specialty item. So again, if you have the budget for it, go for it, um, but definitely not necessary. So if you don't want to go with bags, um, you can do what my friend Scav did, which is just take all your stuff, load it on the bike, strap it down. Um, no need for special bags. Um, this bike in particular, they found in a friend's garage. Um, they fixed it up for like seven bucks and got a couple baskets, put their stuff in, some bungee cords, and you're good to go. Um, I really like this because it goes to show that with bicycle travel, you really don't have to spend a lot of money. You can do a lot with not very much. Um, so if you are going to be camping along the way, you're also going to want camping supplies. Um, so you know your tent, your sleeping pad, a camping stove, those are all good things to bring with you. Um, this is my setup, so you can see I've got a couple panniers on the front and the back, and then on the back rack of my bike, it's got my tent, my sleeping pad, um, I pack my sleeping bag in one of my panniers, and that also carries my um, hammock and my little camping stove. So that just means that, you know, I can camp wherever I want, I don't have to worry about paying for a hotel or um, staying with people if I don't want to. Now I would also recommend um, checking out Warm Showers and Couchsurfing. These are two free hospitality websites where you can stay with hosts um, free of charge. Um, not only is this great to give you a shower and a bed to sleep in once in a while, but you also get to meet really, really great people. Um, so as an example, this is my warm, or sorry, my couch surfing host, Andreas, who I met in, I stayed with in Destin, Florida. Um, I ended up staying with him for four or five days. Um, he lived really close to the, this gorgeous white sand beach and um, he took me kayaking and we went on a couple bike rides. He was from Germany and so we got really um, we got along really well talking about all the kind of odd things about the southern United States compared to where we lived. Um, so again I got to stay with someone for free um, but I also got to meet a really really interesting person and for me that brings a lot of value to travel. Now other than those basic supplies um, my second tip is actually to not bog yourself too much um, with planning. Um, I mean, unless you really want to. The reality of bike touring is that you are never going to be fully prepared for what the road brings you. Um, you can think you have everything you need and you're going to have missed something. You can plan a route if you want to, but chances are it's going to change anyway. Um, I, I would say it's good to have a rough plan. Um, and to just cover your bases. But when you start getting into the nitty gritty details, I found for me that it's just a barrier to actually getting out there and doing it. Um, my initial plan, for example, looked somewhat like this. Um, it was gonna take me from Ontario down through Tennessee, down to Texas, across to Georgia, and then back up the East Coast home. And I was gonna stay um, and work at different farms and sanctuaries um, for a month at a time. So you can see one in Tennessee, one in Texas, and then one in Georgia. Um, none of that actually happened. So um, instead of this route, I ended up A, going to Disney World with um, a friend and her family. Here's us with Pooh Bear. Um, then I, from eventually made it to Tennessee um, and traveled south along the Natchez Trace and I was actually a week behind schedule um, when I met this other cyclist from California, David, and we ended up traveling together for three weeks including a week in New Orleans. Here's us um, a few, I think, ten miles out of the city. Um, 
and so again, not in my plan, but quite an adventure. Um, I skipped Texas entirely and instead stayed for three months at a farm sanctuary, um, flying pig animal sanctuary in um, northern Florida, southern Georgia. Um, and I was adopted into the family over the three months. Here's us at Christmas in our matching pajamas. Um, I got to be part of the family, uh, Christmas family photo. Um, I also, uh, oh, here's us on my last day at the farm with some of the residents of the sanctuary. And while I was there, I also adopted a baby goat whose name is Leo. He was um, orphaned as a newborn and we brought him in and I got to watch him grow up from this little um, baby who couldn't walk to a bustling boy chewing on everything and headbutting all the other goats. Um, and then in the end, my initial plan had been to ride, give myself two months to ride up the East Coast, but unfortunately COVID hit and I had to um, get a car and drive back to Canada before the borders closed. So none of this is what I had planned for. Um, here's me in... Um, this was in New York State. I was just dropped off the car. It was cold. Like my goal had been to miss the Canadian winter, but the universe had different plans, struck the world with this virus, and I had to come back earlier than I had hoped. So even though this wasn't what I had planned for, the beauty of the bike is really it's all about living in the present. Um, each day, each hour brings new challenges, which are really just new opportunities for adventure. Um, if I had stuck to my original plan, I would never have experienced all the things that I did. I would have never met all the people that I did, and my trip wouldn't have been... I mean, it would have been magical in other ways, I'm sure, but it was what it was because I strayed away from the plan. Um, so again, although preparation is important um, in terms of a bike trip, I wouldn't let it be a barrier to actually going out and experiencing all that the road has to offer. Now, my third and most important tip is to ride your own ride. Um, when I first set out on my bike trip, I was riding about 60 miles a day, which is around 100 kilometers, and giving myself one rest day a week. Um, I thought that this is what I had to do because it's what I had heard other cyclists do. So. You know, I'm a novice, I, I should follow in the footsteps of fellow bike travelers. Unfortunately, after a few weeks, I was not enjoying this way of traveling. Um, I was, f especially once I hit West Virginia, I was sore, and every morning was a struggle. You know, the mountains were definitely getting the best of me, and I wasn't excited to get on the bike. Um, I started doubting the whole trip, and that's definitely not a nice feeling to have when I'd spent so long building myself up for this. Um, I stayed with a host who was a motorcyclist and I was explaining my, my situation and, and what they explained to me was this concept of riding your own ride, which is that in motorcycling you might see someone else who's going really fast and zipping around corners and you might be tempted to do the same, but you have to remember that their skill set is not the same as yours and so it would be unpleasant and even dangerous to try and ride the way they're riding. Um, they explained that why would you ride someone else's ride when it's your journey and um, it's your experience, so you should be riding it in accordance to what you want and what feels good for you. This um, piece of advice applies really well to bicycle touring. Um, there are, I learned after this conversation, that there are people who travel who are doing like 100 miles every day, which is insane to me. Um, but then there's other people who are touring doing like 20 or 30 miles a day. Um, there are people who try and pack as little as possible on their bike, and they even cut their toothbrushes in half to try and minimize the amount of weight that they're carrying. But then there's other people who tour who pack everything but the kitchen sink on their bike. You know, they're weighed down with like 150 or 200 pounds of stuff. Um, there are people who stay in motels every night and pay for hotels who, um, we call it credit card touring, where they just eat at restaurants exclusively. Um, and there's other people who camp every night um, and will do anything to, to find a camp spot. So for example, this is me and David camping in a baseball diamond dugout because we didn't want to pay for a campsite and we didn't want to pay for a hotel. Um, there really is no right way to adventure. Um, it's about going out there and 
doing whatever feels best for you, um, regardless of someone else, what, regardless of what someone else's ride looks like. And when I adopted this kind of mentality to my bike tour, it became a much more pleasant experience because I was riding my own ride. To conclude, I want to encourage you all to just go out, go out and get on a bike. You know, I can go on and on about how magical bicycles are, and they really are, but the best way for you to understand what I'm saying is to go out and actually experience it for yourself. Go out for a weekend trip, or even just for a few hours. Let go of your destination mindset and see where the road takes you. Especially right now when so many of us feel limited with our travels due to COVID, getting on a bike can show you that you don't need to go far to have an adventure. Pedal around town for a few hours or go get lost on some backcountry roads and see what kinds of hidden gems you can discover right in your own backyard. I can guarantee you from personal experience that you will be surprised by all the things that you find. Thank you for listening and I hope that you all enjoy your adventures.